You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. This is episode 64, Dr. Regan Lance Reitzma on Stoicism and Christianity. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com where you can connect with me on social media, find past episodes, and join my Discord chat server for interactive discussion. Support my work by becoming a donor through Patreon or PayPal to access special rewards, including the ability to have upcoming guests answer your questions, custom-tailored podcast episodes, and personalized one-on-one discussions. Share, comment, like, subscribe, and leave reviews to help support my efforts. Email me with your thoughts, justinvacula at gmail.com. A short podcast note before discussion with today's guests. From this episode on, I'll be completing audio edits and remastering on my own. Thanks to John Bartman of John Bartman Content Writing and Music Production for helping me with the audio end of this podcast since early 2018. Find his website at johnbartman.com. If you'd like to volunteer your time with audio editing or something else like promotions or marketing, contact me to be part of the podcast team. Today's guest is Dr. Regan Lance Reitzma. Assistant Professor of Philosophy at King's College in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. He joins me to talk about similarities and differences between Stoicism and Christianity. We talk about gratitude, prudence, integrity, humility, having proper perspective, goal setting, minimalism, and finding meaning in life, including one's vocation. Dr. Reitzma received a philosophy PhD in 2007 from The Ohio State University and obtained a bachelor's degree from the Departments of Philosophy and Classics from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He specializes in moral psychology, practical rationality and practical normativity, tolerance, and moral rights. He also includes philosophy of religion, ethical theory and applied ethics, social and political philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, human Kant, and sports in his areas of competency. Find his work at kings.edu and academia.edu. See links in the show notes. On to today's discussion. Thank you very much for coming on today for discussion. I'm happy to be here. Good. We have you as a returning guest as we talked about humility about a year ago. And today we'll talk about parallels and differences between Stoicism and Christianity. As many listeners are from religious traditions, they've also mentioned the overlap between Stoicism and religion in modern day and even long ago. I think that the serenity prayer is something we can start with. It's a, an overlap between Stoicism and Christianity having this idea of acceptance, accepting that which we can't change and working to know the difference between what's inside and outside our control. Yes, I think, you know, I think you're noticing a, a real similarity there. The, the serenity prayer does kind of naturally when you read it, uh, if you've uh, read a bit of stoicism, you will, uh, stoicism will pop in your mind as well. I think, I think that's right. There's at least kind of this kind of broad sense of helping to, to change with wisdom the things I can't control and to accept what I can't. And that's obviously a, a central a distinction between you can and can't control is right at the heart of stoicism and stoic thinking. It's a central part of stoic wisdom to be able to notice what you can and can't control. So there's that kind of broad similarity, although I have a feeling a lot of the people, uh, Christians, who uh, articulate the serenity prayer might draw the lines between what they can and can't control quite differently than, than your, say, ancient Stoic. But uh, there is a, a kind of broad structural mm-hmm. similarity. I think you're right. Yeah, that's that's an overlap there, thinking about that idea as that's helped many people throughout some difficult or trying times rather than cursing God or cursing the universe. It's perhaps working to be more content about things and having a more proper response, one that's going to be productive, realistic, and fitting for the situation. Yeah, I mean, we we all can be prone to, to lacking perspective, right? Uh, and so thinking we can control things we can't, being anxious about things that maybe uh, we really ought not to be anxious about, uh, worried that, you know, about things that we maybe shouldn't uh, uh, worry so much about. And in both the serenity prayer and in stoicism, there's a, a kind of discipline uh, that helps us to, to try to look past, you know, gain perspective and look past our, so those anxiety, fears, those sometimes forms of pride, thinking that we control things that we don't. And, and so, again, I, I certainly see a strong connection there to gain perspective on 
on our reactions to our lives and, and our reactions to the things that have, have happened in those lives. Again, I think there, that, uh, you know, stoicism might draw the line in a different spot between what we can control and what we can't than at least many Christians would. But uh, that, that desire to gain perspective and to critique our own, react to our lives and to the world we live in um, is, is, a, is a profound similarity. Mm -hmm. And that perspective within Christian thought, it's on a more global level, or even something thinking about all of humanity, not just ourself, not just this idea of, oh, well, what can I do to gain more money, gain more wealth? It's about some self-improvement, some accountability to others, accountability to the yeah. world, mm -hmm. right? I see that's often the case in Stoic writing, too. Yeah, I mean, that that's... Uh... I think, you know, one of the most profoundly attractive things about Stoic writing, and Stoics were really early cosmopolitan, universal egalitarians, thinking that each each uh, human life had this profound significance and worth. Uh, we were first and foremost citizens of the uh, of the cosmos uh, in an equal uh, position with other citizens of the cosmos. And, and that's not a theme that you see in, in, in most of the other ancient Greek thinking. And so that this came came uh, about in, in ancient Stoicism is really quite striking. And, and Christianity obviously um, ended up having a similar strongly sense of the uh, case, the image bearing of, of each human being, the profound moral worth of each human being is there in, in Christianity as well. So you get passages about neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female. You know, and again, those are passages and they don't happen to be the way the Stoics put the, the idea, but uh, they have equivalent passages about you know, the cosmopolitan uh, life we should live. Right. It's talking of all people being capable of reason, all people being capable of virtue, right. and an emphasis on self-improvement, on progress being possible, although it can be a difficult task. There's even recognition of having yeah. gratitude, which I see as a common idea that pops up in Christianity as well. We can think about our natural abilities provided to us by nature or providence that we might hear in Stoicism or Christianity that rather than focusing on what's going poorly, we can appreciate what's going well, making the best use of our abilities in current situation. Yeah, and so the, some of the Stoics talk about choosing which handle to grab. Um, the occasions of your life, you you can interpret them in different ways, and you have to choose which handle, as it were, to grab them by. Um, if your brother has harmed you, do you focus on the fact that it, um, you've been harmed, or do you focus on the fact that you're, you're, it's your brother that you're interacting with? So you're picking up on a theme of gratitude that I'm a little less familiar with in, in Stoic thinking, but uh, this kind of sense that uh, we should we should be choosing how to interpret the world, that we have the power to to choose which interpretations, which judgments we make about the world, and then even to focus on elements of the situation that are more likely to lead to positive uh, and and, and forward-looking responses rather than dwelling on it, say the insult or dwelling on the loss uh, or you know the, to dwell instead on the fact that the person interacting with is an old friend or or a brother or mm -hmm. another bear or the divine, divine spark you know there's something really uh, um, empowering about that and there's something really profound about that it's a, a, a very important theme and I think you're right a theme in Christianity too to, to, to decide you know how am I going to look at the people around me? How am I going to evaluate the situations around me? By, by what lens am I going to, to make decisions? And, and uh, But it is, a, again, a, as you're right, a very attractive form of stoicism, uh, a feature of stoicism. Right. And there's this idea in Christianity about neighborly love about just being one of the persons mm -hmm. in a kingdom of God, seeing that, well, we're in this community, we're working together, we have this shared sort of brotherhood, which goes back to the cosmopolitan theme. And even in your upbringing, as you mentioned, you even grew up in a religious community that was connected. Yeah, I grew up in a, a Dutch Calvinist community that, though uh, it was maybe already losing some of its old Dutch Calvinism, um, uh, you know, it was a couple generations in or my parents were Dutch immigrants, but in any case, there was a kind of moral rigorism in the, the, the Dutch community I grew up in that, similar to a, a kind of rigorism you see in some stoical thinking, this really deep sense of responsibility of, you know, our actions are our are, are doing, and we ha we ought to be profoundly reflective and, and quite frankly, highly self-critical of ourselves as, as we make our decisions. Uh, and there's kind of, deep, again, deep sense of responsibility for our own lives that you also see in, in, in stoical thinking, kind of a, a sense that you're really a deep deep commitment to, to living out certain kinds of virtues, some of them having strong theological content and some of them having more broadly moral content. Uh, that kind of attitude, those kind of attitudes were, were there in my upbringing. And, and, and so when I first started reading Stoicism, you could, you could see those connections. I, you could also see that, you know, Stoics, Epictetus, 
you know, uh, uh, at one point said uh, he gave more, no more regard to the Roman Empire than he did to his own piss pot. <laughs> there was a, a kind of attitude in the Dutch Calvinist history, too, where they, they had a, a god big enough that they didn't mind standing up to kings. Now, that's an exaggeration. I mean, there are plenty of Dutch Calvinists who are anything and were, mm. were nowhere near that courageous. But there was something about the, the philosophy, the way of looking that sometimes empower people to, to stand up to, to people who are supposed to be so much more important and see them as just a, that's just another person. And, and my primary commitments are to God or to the Logos. Uh, I, I needn't give that came any more regard than I'd give any other human being. And there's a kind of toughness in that that, uh, anyhow, resonated certainly with young Regan when I was growing up. And it was at least an attractive feature of my upbringing. There's also a kind of strong sense in my community, the kind of Dutch Calvinist community, that you are what you believe. There's a really strong emphasis. Sometimes it comes out as a, a really problematic dogmatism. It could be a lot of polemicism. You know, the, the Dutch Calvinists spend too much time defining themselves against the, the Catholics or something like that. It could be that, but there could also be this really strong and important sense that it's really crucial to, to how you live your life is what you believe. And obviously the Stoics uh, had a, a radical vision for um, and recognized that their, their views were oftentimes profoundly counterintuitive to people around them. So you are what you believe. You're going to live a life according to the kinds of convictions you have in a, in a deep sense. And, and that kind of seems seriousness of thinking uh, that's present in Stoicism and the willingness, again, to have unconventional views that most of the people around you don't have was also there in my Dutch Calvinist community, at least in some strains of it. And so, anyhow, those kind of themes, when I started reading Stoicism, uh, resonated. And I wasn't su- I wasn't sort of su- uh, surprised when I started hearing that Calvin himself was pretty strongly influenced by the Stoics. Right. There's this idea in Stoicism of having a good foundation. And as you mentioned, having some core virtues Mm -hmm. or values. And if we really have no direction, as it's noted, well, where can we really end up? What's the point? What's the whole journey? As people look for meaning, they've perhaps fallen away from certain traditions or started to question the wisdom of crowds, as you've alluded to. Mm -hmm. Stoicism offers this framework from which to work from, some inspiration, some motivation, and some meaning that one can find in life, pursuing virtue, doing good, improving the self, helping others, working from several core virtues as our often focused on in Christian ethics. My actually kind of route, especially thinking about their emphasis on integrity and, and the development of virtue, it, it just mm-hmm. consistently reminds me of Socrates. I mean, this is the way that the Stoics see themselves as, as followers and disciples of Socrates, right? This, uh, uh, In reading Socrates, I, I'm always quite impressed, or anyhow, I initially was very impressed by Socrates as a young reader, and then for a little while I started noticing the passages in the Scrag Dialogues where uh, Socrates would yammer on and on about, about uh, you know, uh, was it was it just one horse trainer who trains a horse, or is it many? And I'd, uh, I'd, I'd wish Socrates would actually talk about the, the ideas I really want him to at greater length. And then I kind of came back uh, just to see how, how uh, to Socrates, to see how how, how much it didn't matter to him that people thought this person is crazy. He's a lunatic. He doesn't talk like the rest of us. He doesn't think like the rest of us. He has these bizarre ideas that no good man can be harmed by a, a bad man. And and in the long run, I you know I really kind of respect Socrates' willingness to just you know he, he thinks the thoughts he thinks. He he thinks about them very carefully. He interrogates other people and talks to them about them and is happy and begs people to to challenge his views. But when other people don't give good reasons, and, and yet he feels convicted. Uh, he's happy to stand alone uh, at even some personal cost. And, and that's, you know, obviously inspired the Stoics. And it is an inspiring set of traits, a kind of deep commitment to integrity, that self-possession that when you when you think you might well have a good answer, and, and uh, even though, you know, lots of people won't agree, don't agree with it, uh, if you haven't seen good arguments against it, you're willing to, to kind of to, to stand your ground a bit. Th- those are inspiring traits. And, and, and that's especially, you know, you see in, in and, and, and Stoics too, the, mm-hmm. the willingness to moral and also at some level intellectual integrity. So, you know, that de- de- diminishes the concerns about faith, uh, uh, fame, excuse me, and wealth. Th- those aren't the, the Stoic masters, uh, fame and wealth and acclaim and glory. Nice to have if you can get them, but if they don't come, you know, what's it to me? And uh, there's something really powerful about that and, and something I hope, you know, my kids and my students and so on can, can see that, the honor and 
and that kind of integrity. And, and again, one of the, the uh, flip sides of that is that people are going to have masters, but who is your master going to be? Is it going right. to be, you know, an anxious concern about about being trendy or hip or uh, you know famous or or well to do or uh, financially and so on? Like, you know, even if those things are nice to have, uh, that kind of honor that that holds you to the doing what you take to be the right thing, even if it's like not popular or come at, with some personal costs and an ordinary sense of the personal cost. You know, and again, you know, I, I would think that that thoughtful Christians would also <laughs> be moved by those thoughts. But it's really Socrates who kind of seems to me an especially, you know, notable example of that and, and one that the Stoics are obviously trying to to capture. Good. So it's a yeah. questioning of what is it that we should really value as we see so many other people mm-hmm. say working all of these long hours, they hate their jobs, but they have to have that new yeah. gadget or that brand new car. Mm-hmm. And is that really going to provide them happiness in the long run? Whereas the Stoics would take a different perspective and say, well, let's question that. Is that really the life we want to have? Is the juice worth the squeeze? And Stoics would say, no, mm-hmm. they're, they're calling for a more minimalistic, frugal life where true wealth is found in wisdom and contentment. Yeah, it, it raises the question about preferred indifference, mm-hmm. right? Um, how strongly are we permitted to still prefer fame, wealth. Uh, yeah, Marcus Aurelius obviously had a, a profoundly privileged upbringing and raised to be an emperor. And in the obvious sense, even if he wasn't uh, as ostentatious, not even close to as ostentatious as many Roman emperors, well, you know, obviously he, he had a, had focuses other than some of the worst of the Roman emperors. He didn't eschew all of that. And that's a, that's a tricky thing in a Christian life. That's a tricky thing in a Stoic life. It's a tricky thing, a really uh, difficult question in, 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 a, in a morally serious life is that um, even if we're willing to put integrity or our, our commitment to the divine uh, logos or to, to Christ mm-hmm. or something like that first, h- how much is it only paying lip service to saying, well, I prefer the, to be well-to-do and to have a nice house, or I prefer these things, but I don't need to have them. Uh, the Stoicism does, authentic Christianity does, any number of other really you know, morally serious uh, worldviews. How much do they ask us to really give away? You know, what, what is having them, but but not needing them, being willing to give them up for in crucial circumstances enough. You know, I go, those are, those are things that I have to work out in my own life and kind of, you know, fear and trembling, I suppose. Uh, I, ha- I have some stuff too and things that aren't necessary. And I think I'd give them up under the right circumstances. But anyhow, yeah, yeah, that, that, this is a tricky thing for the Stoics. You know, how, how frugal do they expect us to be? It's also a tricky thing for, for Christians to know. Yeah, and it's just questioning those things and, oh, well, do we really need that? Well, it might be nice to have that one thing, that nice phone or that decent car, but how much are we to go, right? Well, if we're spending all of our money on so-called fine dining and these expensive vacations, but then we're lamenting living paycheck to paycheck, well, we've gone wrong there. We can adjust ourselves, have some more discipline, even in the area of eating, right? Well, we might enjoy those sweets and those fatty foods, but oh, then we end up overweight and we feel sluggish and then we have health problems, right? So we can really question, well, what is it that will lead to that good life? How can we find fulfillment? Maybe we could find that fulfillment in other things than material possessions. And I think that's something that comes up in Christian themes as well. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the kind of com- kind of examples that you're bringing up actually seem to have especially to do with prudence, right? You know, I might enjoy those those sweets, but if I keep indulging in them, I'm, I'm, it's not going to be good for me. And I might, it's maybe not such a bad thing to find a, a nice meal, a nice thing, but do we eat ourselves to excess and unhealthiness? Uh, but those are questions about prudence. I, I, I tend to think that you know, kind of a serious stoic will think also profoundly about not only prudence, but, you know, again, I think a serious Christian too, well, if we're really going to call the other members of the human uh, race all enjoying the divine spark or mm-hmm. having the same rational capacities and so therefore the same deep moral worth. Uh, they're all going to be image bearers of, of God and so of profound and inestimable worth. You know, how, there's also then a, kind of a moral question, a, a deeply value-based uh, question about uh, how much then do we have to give up to any number of causes that would benefit other people than ourselves, political causes, charitable causes, and so on. And uh, I, I think this is a tough question both for, for Stoics and for Christians now. By the way, it was prompted by your comment that, uh, you know, Stoicism drives, you know, asks mm-hmm. us to live an extremely frugal life. And, and so I think you're, you might be answering the question of asking by saying to be stripping away quite a bit of what we have <laughs> uh, to give. I think no doubt Stokes are living an ostentatious and stoical life would be fairly deeply incoherent, but how much giving does that require, right? Uh, how, how, how much do we have to have only? And those are, that's a tough question. It's a difficult thing. Yeah, as individuals' lives, their skills, their uh-huh. resources 
can differ. And even the question of time is important. And the Stoics want us to be mindful right. of that, given that life is short and we have all these opportunities. There are some trade-offs, some opportunity costs that, oh, well, if we're going to spend our time watching Netflix series, well, we could be doing other things with that time. Could we be doing something else to better the common good? And at the same time, we want to have some sort of balance because if we do too, too much, then we end up burning out and then we lack capacity to help others. There's a lot of talk of self-care, especially in the counseling field. Yeah, so there are questions on what sort of expectations can be reasonable. One, one question kind of at the heart of this is how easy is it to develop Stoic virtue? How is it easy is it to develop Christian virtue? Again, with the mm-hmm. thought that there's going to be some overlap between the virtues that Stoics and Christians admire and attempt to engender in their own lives. But how difficult are those virtues to develop? And I'm inclined to think they're not right. easy at all. It's easy to pay lip service and, and difficult to actually, you know, change yourself. And because of the Stoic emphasis on, on self-discipline, that sig- signals that the Stoics have a recognition that this isn't easy either, you know. So in some cases, you should start every morning entertaining the things mm-hmm. that are most likely to tempt you so that be you're better way. equipped to fight them. And, and it takes a, a lot of work right. to, right, yeah, to, to notice your proto-emotions, keep them from becoming emotions or bad emotions. Uh, these, these things are not easy and, and you know maybe maybe in our contemporary climate there are strains of us strains of our culture that <laughs> yeah. hopes being good would be easy <laughs> you know I, I had mentioned earlier that i don't know I, get, I grew up in a fairly morally rigorous community and you know you could actually overstate it i could talk at more length about the little dutch farming community i grew up in and you know there's problems there there's weaknesses there but but there was a kind of moral seriousness at least strains of moral seriousness and it also, you know, Dutch Calvinists are not going to give the answer how easy is it to become Christ-like. Mm-hmm. They're going to say, you know, we're, we're not, we're broken, we're fallen. <laughs> it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, if we try, if we try, we think we're going to do it on our own, we're going to, going to fail. And, and you're, you're going to cause a certain suffering in yourself for, because of your failure. Um, anyhow, so, I mean, this kind of moral rigorism, again, is something, though, that I, I yeah. very much identify as in, sto- in serious Stoic thinking. Some contemporary Stoic talk, what you call maybe small s Stoicism, well, sometimes treat Stoicism as a kind of useful corrective, kind of a self-help corrective. It can be profound and wise and thoughtful, but it really focuses on overcoming undue desire or undue fear or anxiety. But Stoic, Stoicism as a kind of ancient worldview was extremely morally rigorous, more than uh, you certainly wouldn't call it only a self-help philosophy. And maybe I'm being unfair to some contemporary Stoics, but there's a deep moral rigorism there that, again, uh, say I kind of identify with uh, and how, how much concentration it would take to, uh, to engage in kind of self-improvement that the Stoics really want. Right. We see a lot of it today talking about Stoicism as a life hack and, and just focusing on little aspects of it, but not getting a fuller picture. So here, I hope to provide that fuller picture and talk about the different virtues and the different approaches. There are going to be different communities that respond differently. Like there's ideas of, oh, well, people who are entrepreneurs have looked towards Stoicism and applied mm-hmm. it to gain more money. Are they doing more with it, though, is a, a question is, oh, well, you could see even in Christian traditions, people will tend to parade a prosperity gospel. And a lot of Christians, Mm -hmm. the more serious ones certainly don't like that, right? Should it really be about making all this money and flying Mm -hmm. jets and wearing snazzy suits? Surely not. That doesn't seem to go with a more serious position that people would be talking about. To go back to your other idea here, Stoics talk a lot about role models, Socrates being one of those, Cato, and they talk about the Stoic sage in that, oh, well, it's really rare for someone to have this down pat and be this Mm -hmm. perfect Stoic, so to say. It's as rare as the mythical phoenix is some talk that people have, but we can look towards certain role models. We can look toward certain figures, certain Mm -hmm. virtues, and try to reach that and progress. I see many in Christian traditions saying, well, we should be more Christ-like. We should follow the path of Jesus, the the path of Paul, many other people who are role models, who are people we can look up to and and try to emulate and noting those progresses and working toward achieving some sort of standard, even if we'll fall short of it. Well, that's part of being human, right? But we can recognize improvement and progress we make. Even Epictetus talks about being angry, and he's become less angry over time. And he's had a Thanksgiving or thrown a festival, I think, as he says, uh, when he notices himself being less angry. And that's, that's a big victory. 
Yeah, so when you have any extremely idealistic worldview or, or moral outlook, you know, there's always going to be this kind of question, well, what if we don't, the bar is set so high, we simply can't live up. And another real worry about having an extremely idealistic outlook with rigorous standards and so on is going to be a deep question about how you wield those standards. Are they primarily wielded against self to check, you know, how am I doing? Where am I really at? Uh, where are my weaknesses? What are the things that I have to overcome? What's the right decision for me right now? How should I be or do you use those standards, you know, primarily as the standards used to judge other folks? And, you know, and one of the nice, some of the Stoics will actually stress, use your, use your Stoical commitments, rigorous as they are, primarily uh, on self. And then, and then but, but don't go walking around the world saying, right now you're failing by the Stoic ideal. And to, the, to a friend, for instance, who has just lost a, a child, say, uh, you know, so far as words go, press sympathy. And even if that person's making a judgment that's in somehow an error, you know, that that child is crucial the life of that child is crucial to their own happiness. Don't say that, right? So, and there's a kind of move. There's a kind of important move there. To, to to what purpose again do you put these ideals? Are they are they crucially uh, first and foremost to look at the planks in your own eye? Are they are they then primarily to to feel superior to others? You know, judge others. And again, I, one of the nice things that when I first read the passages in the Stoics that said those things, I was like, now there's an analog there with I know the the best of the Christian thinking that I bumped into. In my growing up years, you know, the uh, kind of grace shown to others who aren't Stoics in this case, right? So, so anyhow, that, that's a crucial thing. And then, you know, as we're talking about a moment ago, how to, how to respond to uh, if you have extremely high ideals <laughs> and we're likely to fall by them. I take it a serious, rigorous Stoic and a serious, rigorous Christian would want to say more than yeah, we're human, you know, because <laughs> that, that can bleed into a kind of kind of making excuses. Uh, so how do you kind of keep yourself, you know, on the path of a fight and struggle at the same time that you don't, on the one hand, despair of your inabilities. On the other hand, just keep giving yourself, you know, blank checks and too many allowances. So th those are, you know, going to be, you know, really important questions. And the Stoics don't all agree with each other on, on, on how, to, how to handle that. You give yourself an occasional allowance. Let yourself cry sometimes, <laughs> as a, even as a Stoic. Yeah, so some moderation in that and not being too harsh on ourselves, but also not saying, oh, well, you know, you can cheat and have that Krispy Kreme donut every day. You know, it doesn't really matter. Oh, I'm just human. It, it smelled so good. Right? <laughs> That's not going to be the right approach to take, right? Having a more balanced perspective, being more aware of our own capabilities and also setting goals, setting some reasonable goals yeah. and noting that the goals will take time, right? It's, people might say, oh, well, I'm going to lose 25 pounds, I'm going to set this New Year's resolution. And for many, it just doesn't happen. Maybe they're not as serious about it. They lack the willpower. They didn't put in all that determination. They didn't have the discipline, right? And they'll say, oh, well, that was just thing. Uh, oh, I just, I'm human, right? That's not going to be a good response. That's not taking accountability for the issue. So we want to be more serious in our goal setting, more understanding of our own situation. Again, when it comes to kind of setting goals, when I, with, with the, with the question is kind of matters of prudence and personal health, I'd really like to lose 14 pounds. In those kind of cases, I think there is a really strong argument mm -hmm. to keeping your goals extremely manageable. There's just kind of a, there's kind of an argument that you're if you set the if you set the bar too high for yourself, you probably are setting yourself up for failure. Creating realistic goals that are maybe just a touch beyond your ability to grasp with only a little bit of effort. It does take some effort, but not Herculean to get them. When it comes to kind of matters of prudence, you know, again, losing a few pounds and keeping a little bit of that better eye on your checkbook or your, your buy a bank account or those sorts of things, I, I tend to say, oh, you know, keep your goals modest, just barely beyond your easier reach. Don't set them too high. You're probably setting yourself up for failure. But again, I tend to think there's a big disanalogy here when we talk about kind of moral rigorism. I, if, if I'm going to set reasonable goals for moral self-improvement. I'd want to do that, though, inside of a larger picture where the ideals aren't compromised, right? So I still think that the, the life of that person I don't know uh, who's struggling, say, in a, in a refugee camp really does profoundly matter. And I don't want to just pay lip service to that, follows from my worldview that that person matters, so I'll say that. I really ought to be doing something about some of the major problems in the world. No, I don't know that I'm, I can empty all my bank accounts and, and give all of my money away or, or even start giving, you know, uh, every penny I don't absolutely need away. Uh, I might end up having to notice my humanity and temper my expectations a little bit, but it's going to still be inside this larger vision that stays you know, very rigorous. You know, when it comes to kind of these moral questions about how we ought to be, I, I, I'm even more committed to really high standards and high ideals. Uh, I'm nervous about giving them up as a central part of my thinking about these questions. Uh, and again, I tend to see that as at least an ancient Stoic 
that kind of rigor is there too. Uh, you know, a real aversion. Folks maybe even have such a real aversion to saying, oh, we're only really human that they tend to exaggerate how powerful we are. You know, no, you really control everything that happens inside of you. You're, you're in control of every decision, every character trait, every, you know, and, and uh, if anything, you might accuse the Stokes of, of overstating our, our moral capacity rather than diminishing the demand on us, you know, the moral rigorous, the rigors on, on self. So again, uh, you know, again, Stokes are happy to talk about matters of prudence, you know, don't feel anxiety. That makes no, that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. I don't know. I'm, I keep pressing us back to this bigger picture. That's not only about those kinds of questions. But. Right. And there's even talk in some modern authors about what they call the trichotomy of control that, well, we might have some influence on some things and a lack of influence, but we can be focused on a process. We can think about, again, set a goal, try to go about it, do the best that we can. And know our own strengths, know what we're capable of as well. You're working as a professor and you're able to teach students, connect with them. But if we're to say, oh, we'll go out and go to Ghana and spend some time with people there, well, that might not be the best use of your abilities, but you're doing something to give back. And that's a laudable position to be in, that we have certain roles and certain stages of life that we have certain abilities that we can hone to make the world a better place. Do you think that the Stoics, I'm kind of talking again about the ancient Stoics, do you think they have a notion of vocation? There's some talk about having a job that's worthwhile or pursuing some worthwhile interest. They talk about politics that I've seen throughout and saying that if we're going to compromise our character in order to gain political favor or to gain votes, to deceive people, to try to have some popular approval, that's something that we shouldn't want, that we shouldn't sell out, we shouldn't Mm -hmm. compromise our values, but it seems to be a more open question of, well, how should we spend our time laboring or what should be this main goal for us? And many people can take on different goals and apply stoicism in their position. Mm -hmm. Even Marcus Aurelius, as you mentioned, was an emperor. He was about and with the people working to improve society. Epictetus as a teacher, Seneca as Mm -hmm. an advisor, and many others just being there in the community. There's this talk of, well, what good is philosophy if it's not going to be helping other people if it can't be applied, if it doesn't have some practical value that, oh, well, we can talk about rhetoric, we can talk about words, and well, that might have some benefit, but we want to focus on what's practical and what can help the community. And for that, it seems to be an open question that people can apply that to all kinds of different roles in life. Yeah, and I, and I haven't in particular, you know, I'm asking the question probably because uh, for here's kind of a two part reason. Uh, one, I, I've been kind of emphasizing uh, I'm moved by the uh, moral rigorism of ancient Stoicism, the this, this sense that uh, we have a deep responsibility for our character and the cho- each of the choices we make. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. know that I agree and uh, full heartedly with all of what the Stoics think on this, but I something about that picture that's very attractive to me. But then the question is, is that not going to be crushing? You know, you, um, you're, you're going to have failures of character. You're going to make bad choices. And then, you know, this, this so, so the philosophy says, but that's mm-hmm. on you then. I mean, you really do have the power. It can be quite crushing to, to fail and to fail quite consistently and predictably, <laughs> even mm-hmm. as you have a philosophy that tells you you can do this. Now, again, we've talked about some of the ways that Stoics have responded to that. You know, a few Stoics would say, well, I do mm-hmm. take a holiday from time to time from my rigorism, and I let some of my inappropriate emotions bleed out for a little bit. I, I cry for a little bit for my friend, and then I pull myself back together, you know, my friend who's just died or had a loss. Uh, so I give myself a, a break from time to time, or, you know, there's a kind of take the long view. I'll keep working. I'll find ways to, to improve myself gr- gradually and incrementally, and that'll get me in the direction of the high ideal. And, 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 and to add to the high idealism of stoicism, you know, there's the, there's the kind of passages where it'll say if you've, if you've even broken one of the laws, you've, you've broken the whole law. You know, I'm, I'm coming closer to quoting the Bible here than, you know, James than I am to the Stoics, but that same idea is there. If you sin according to one statute, you've, you've broken the entire law. That kind of notion, that, again, that's that rigorism. But what I'm kind of asking about the vocation is there's also this notion that, uh, you know, you're only one person. Uh, you're one person, and there's, you know, you're one citizen in the, in the world, uh, and you're, but you're only one person, and now, now find your role. You know, that's the second stage in, in, in the in discipline, right? You, you kind of cl- uh, get a sense of, oh, well, my, my emotions are my judgments. I, I am in control. And then uh, advice sometimes is, now, now find your role. Find what has the great playwright told you to do. Are you a carpenter? Are you a constructor? Or, you know, are you a statesman like uh, Marcus Aurelius? Are you a, 
a servant and then mm-hmm. play that role adroit, adroitly, you know, really well, do it superbly. And I do wonder whether this is a response to the rigorism. I'm not sure about this. And I'm kind of, again, this is a kind of open question, but mm-hmm. uh, that's why I'm probably why I'm asking. Do you think the Stoics have a notion of vocation? That kind of language that's not, uh, comes out, you know, what, what role did the great playwright give you? Capital P, P that's a reference to God or providence or the divine, right? The, what did he give you? Find it and, and play it well, whether that's as a servant or as a, an emperor. And so anyhow, that, that sounds like a notion of vocation. I kind of wonder whether in some Stoics, it, it was, it's a thought that, you know, I, I have to do uh, things, but I, I only have to do the things that my role requires. And that means being really good at the following six things, right? And that, that, that can be a way of pulling the crushing burden of this rigor partly off. You don't have to solve the world's problems, but you have to solve the problems that are connected to the, the vocation you have. Yeah, that if you happen to be a counselor, it's a path I'm aspiring to. Well, we can say there's good public good in that, that we want to be the best counselor we can or to be a very good one to really take the practice seriously, to be focused, to have concern, to have empathy, to work with people through their struggles, and to do it well. And maybe, oh, well, a person for some kind of circumstance might have grown up in a fishing community, and that's what they happen to do. Or, oh, well, they're in a warehousing job, and they haven't really been afforded many other opportunities, and that's what they're doing. And maybe they could take that money and give it to some charity, find some good purpose in it. We're not going to just uh, toil for nothing and do some meaningless work. We can work to find right. meaning in the current state that we have in life. And if we're lacking it, then we could change yeah. or work to change what we can about the situation. Even musicians out there can have a good impact on the world for a better. And it's an interesting thing is what vocation will a person take up? How can they do it? Well, maybe there's not a simple answer because it's different from person to person, but yet still they can apply their moral rigor, as you say, to the role they end up playing in life. Yeah, there's a worry here about this, especially if our example is if you're a slave, be a mm-hmm. good slave, do that adroitly. If you're an emperor, be a good emperor, do that adroitly. Uh, the worry there is is that it may kind of quietistically allow, you know, just tell the slaves to go on being slaves, just good ones, right? And, you know, that, that's not, that doesn't sound like the start of a social movement <laughs> or something like that. So there's a worry about that. But there, there is, I think, a kind of wisdom to this. You know, it's going to have to be in the direction that, that you're talking about. I mean, presumably, of course, in our kind of socioeconomic environment, we play a serious role in choosing which direction career-wise and otherwise mm-hmm. we go. And so, you know, you're trying to figure out what are my strengths. Well, you seem to have strengths as a, as a counselor, and you picked up on those, and you're working your way to doing what good you can in a role that fits your your strengths. And anyhow, again, there there is a kind of that that's a, a way of thinking about vocation, right? I'm I'm going to I'm going to have my powerful small cosmically, but powerful locally in a way mm-hmm. impacts and and generate the character traits and so on that make me as good a counselor as I can be. Now, you're probably also a citizen, so you can, can probably spend some time doing that well, too. You can probably occupy several roles. And you're right, you know, you and I are going to have some, some of us going to have different roles. But anyhow, I, I kind of wonder with the Stoics whether that was a, a partly a strategy that talk of play your role and play it well <laughs> was a way of you and I felt the weight of becoming Stoic sage. It's, it's such a high deal. It's going to, again, it's hard to imagine it's not going to be crushing at some point or you'll have to be totally delusional if you think you're there. Just find the thing that you do well and, and do it really well. Uh, I wonder if that's available to Christians, too, uh, a sense that there, there's so, such you know, creating a the kingdom of ends or, you know, or, or furthering God's kingdom, uh, creating a place of unswerving justice and even greater mercy and forgiveness. What a massive task, right? But uh, two or three are gathered. You know, you're, you every every particular Christian is going to have their social environments too, in which they probably can, with some serious work, uh, have the kinds of impacts further create the kingdom, even in only in small bits, cosmically speaking, right? But that, that, but that, that takes some of that crushing burden off is to, to find your places and your roles and, and to play them well and to generate the character traits and attitudes and beliefs and so on that allow you to play them well. And, and that's, a, that's a prescription for life, right? That's a kind of a prescription for how to live life. Do that thing well. Again, and I like that you bring up musicians and so on too. I mean, they'll have their role to play and 
yeah, there's this recognition in Stoicism that there's a large amount of calamity right. that can happen in life, that a sudden change might have us in exile, might have us captured, and maybe we don't have as many of those concerns today, given modern technology and modern standard of living that's much better than that in ancient times. But there are those ups and downs in life, and there is that idea of just making the best of circumstances the most we can. Epictetus, he compares life to a game of dice and saying that we don't know how the dice are going to turn up, but we can use what turns up and apply our skill, do the best with that. Try to make the most of situations. There's even this idea in Christian thought as well, as well, no problem is too much for me that, oh, well, God has created this universe. This is something that was bound to happen. This is some calamity, but yet I can still have fortitude and do my best to overcome this, to make the most of the situation. Yeah, I, I actually find sometimes that those parts of Stoicism, especially moving, the true that you and I aren't Boethius, you know, trying to make a living in the middle of difficult, uh, you know, Roman politics and easily things could swing the wrong way and you've just been advisor to the wrong person and he's now deposed and you're either in exile or sitting at home waiting to be executed. So you and I are probably not in those circumstances. We're, we're <laughs> in analogous but much less uh, striking examples, you know, where take our risk, throw our dice on the board and play our hands and so on. And I, I do find moving and, you know, and especially when the stakes are really high and some person is exiled from his homeland, which he does love, although presumably only in a sense of a preferred indifference, <laughs> Uh, does care, care about uh, uh, and can move away and say, well, what's that to me? There, there can be real strength in that as long as that what's it to me doesn't reflect I never cared about the place I was or the country I lived in in the first place. If the what's it me is really broad perspective that you've been stressing, uh, you know, well, let's really step back. I mean, true that I really did like living in that home or that estate. I really did like these friends mm -hmm. and now I'm in exile, but there are people in the other country too, and they're worth knowing. Um, th there are places to live and experiences to have uh, there too. And, and you can imagine somebody here, you know, losing their job and having to move out of state. And they liked their life. We've all been through that, even heading to college after high school. I liked my life when I was growing up, but it's a kind of, well, well what's it to me really? I really like that, but there are things to do and experiences to have and houses to build and uh, work to do in, in other corners of the world too. And it can be, you know, th those are very striking and and moving parts of stoicism when when you get the sense that 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 stoic really means it right i mean he he really is able to set aside the, the things that don't truly matter and move on and do good in a, in a new corner of the world and if he's exiled say and it's seeing that adversity as a challenge as well and saying well i'll rise to the occasion and i still have my mind intact i still have my virtue intact i still have this foundation that i can work from and look i've suffered some calamity or what i thought to be a calamity in the past and i've gotten through it i'm not just going to give up here there's some hope there's some possibility so what I was alluding to and, uh, is, is all very human stuff, right? Uh, I may have liked this uh, hometown or country I was in, and now I'm in exile. Yeah. Well, there are other people. <laughs> you know, they're another place to live. Uh, that That's a kind of, of wisdom available to ordinary human beings uh, with having ordinary thoughts. Uh, I kind of see some of the ancient Stoics as also there's a kind of obedience to the will of the divine. Well, you know, again, I'm quoting now Job rather than the, the uh, Stoics, but it's so close to some Stoic passages. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? And that idea is, is kind of shockingly right there in some Stoic thinking, too. And there, there is, you know, those passages are actually, again, moving to me in a way that's hard to articulate. It, it sounds like you should be really angry at God right now. He giveth, but he also taketh away. I'm talking Job here. He giveth, uh, you know, 14 children, uh, taketh them away and just replaces them with 14 new children. So sometimes it's, you know, that's the will of God. And I, he gave me this life and now he takes it away. It's his to, it's his to take away. Uh, how, how can I complain? You know, there's a, a kind of deeply admirable humility uh, kind of sense of I'm just me, this being above me who He's ordering all things to good. I don't know how to judge all that, but he, he, he gave, he's now taking away. Why should I be upset? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, again, that's a, that's a more Christian or a Jewish sentiment in, in the sense of blessed be the name of. Yeah, there's the talk of, yes, that being a very human thing and that, well, there are other concerns that we have and it's not absolutely necessary. Oh, that job that I had, well, it was nice, but 
look, it wasn't bound to last forever. Change has happened. And let's just adapt to this, accept what has happened and work our best to recover from it. And even in the Stoic text in Seneca, there's a passage that I've quoted before. It's a letter called A Lesson to be Learned from the Burning of Lions, in which a man sees his home area engulfed in a grand fire. Everything is destroyed and he walks away from it. And well, he's had such pride for his home. He's really marveled at the looks of it and found a lot of good things about it. But yet he sees that he can still recover from this spot in life, that there has been some challenge and look, how can I overcome it now? How can I be very bold to continue on, to have courage, not give up in life and still work toward great ends that we can still have without that fancy town, without that nice house, with all these things of the material world? And again, if that's his authentic attitude, it does exemplify fortitude and resilience. And, you know, this is a person who was not defined by his things as much as he, you know, as you seem to describe, he found them beautiful and he said marveled at them and so on. Uh, they, they did not define him, right? He was not possessed by his possessions. Uh, he was self-possessed instead. And those are all, I think, pretty profound virtues. And what I'm actually trying to point to is what you might call a really profound kind of existential humility. That, right is in, in, in some serious stoicism, uh, you know, a kind of, hey, the world, the cause of the world is bigger than me. And I'm one of millions of divine uh, bearers of divine spark. And I'm not the one who's in sovereign control of this. I'm not the creator of this. And so you have the hymn of Zeus from Cleanthes, for instance, a p- picture of a God who's creating everything, right? Utterly in control of everything. And the attitude seems to be, uh, again, it's, it's really an attitude about God, <laughs> He giveth, he taketh away, blessed be his name. You know, there's a kind of subservience, a kind of sense of, again, we might call existential humility in that. I really am under the jurisdiction of not calling the shot. You know, I may uh, be deeply responsible for all my decisions in my own character, my internal life, but I'm not calling the shots in this grander world. And I want to tell you the the reason I'm asking about a stoic notion of vocation is the reason I'm willing to use the kind of language of vocation is that fits into that picture too. Like kind of my, one of my tasks is to, to find the role that I've been given by the Logos, what is it I'm supposed to do, and then to do that really well. I'm just one person who can do who can do some good. Now, what role am I supposed to do that through? And it sense is that that's something that the Logos has determines, right? And um, now this is to emphasize the religious elements of ancient Stoicism. And I, again, I know that many people have liked to kind of pull apart elements of Stoicism from some of its metaphysic or the religious characteristics that are sometimes there. But that, that's something that I think would be harder to hold on to if you de-religiousize a Stoicism. But there can be forms of existential humility. I don't know how about to put it kind of vague about what it is that we are under. <laughs> Yeah, there's a passage in Marcus Aurelius or several passages that people refer to as either gods or atoms in which he says that we can have this ethical framework, we can have purpose, even if it just happens to be atoms, even if it happens to be chance. And if it's God, well, then so be it. Gods or atoms, we can still have this framework. Well, some Christians would think otherwise, that without God, we're lost in a subjective state of affairs or relativism, where one has no grounding for ethics and life is purposeless. I don't know how to, I, I, I don't have an interpretation of those passages of Aurelius. I, I saw that you mentioned them when you contacted me earlier. And so I don't know their context. So I, I'm not going to give a reading of what he meant by them. But I'm going to comment for a moment on them. It does feel like this little moment of agnosticism, right? Uh, I don't know whether there's a divine logos. I don't know uh, whether what what governs everything is uh, workings of the atoms, whether those are deterministic or or not, or the God. And one really interesting question is is you know how much does that say about Marcus Aurelius's broader Stoic worldview? Was he full fledged agnostic, or was he deeply skeptical about the God, or or was he was this a moment in where he who are complicated? They can be serious believers, but then have their dark nights of the soul or their, their fits of agnosticism. And, you know, another possibility is, is that Marcus Aurelius has, a, again, I'm, I'm only speculating because I don't, I don't know how to answer this question about him well, because I don't know the text well enough. A thoughtful person is a pretty complicated being, right? Uh, you know, is it really important to have as part of our broader worldview commitments that we're really committed to, 
plus commitments that we have, though we have doubts about, you know, and so is there this, uh, maybe even a moment of agnosticism? It's a, there's agnosticism there, but tucked into a broader, complex picture of belief, right? I don't know, I kind of wonder with Aurelius, I don't know the answer, but the move to, well, some Christians would say that if there is no God, then nothing really matters, right? Or if there is no God, we're in a subjectivistic, relativistic morass of, uh, where mm-hmm. values are determined only by personal whim or societal custom or something seemingly a lot less deep than God's character or something like that, right? Um, I think that that's too simple of you. Like, even though I have Christian convictions myself, if I were to start doubting those, and I, by the way, tuck some of the doubts into my picture, and I have them, you know, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't stop feeding my kids. I wouldn't stop taking aspirin, right? You know, uh, I don't need some deeper justification than uh, my kids, you know, suffering would be awful and my own headache would kind of suck. Those are just, you know, sending that suffering as, you know, for stalling that suffering is reason enough to do it. We need to have a complicated enough view to recognize that even if, you know, there's no underlying religious structure to undergird values, I'm still going to care about the things that I happen to care about for biological and personal historical and so on reasons and and be happy to do that, right? Not at all inclined to stop. Uh, at the same time, there are things about how I see the world that do feel tightly connected, not whether I feed my children or not, or whether I take the aspirin or not, or whether I can, even whether I continue to teach some philosophy to some students, uh, I can oftentimes see a little bit of good that comes from it uh, for all the, you know, you know, failures and frustrations too. To go ahead and do it, even if there's not a deeper structure that part of, you know, creating the kingdom of ends or furthering God's kingdom in, uh, in some profound sense. But I don't know, there are parts of what I, I think that do feel like they're tighter, more tightly connected to, you know, sort of my underlying religious picture. So I, I wonder if you, if you drop the religious elements of Stoicism, it seems like there would be some things that would would no longer feel like it fit as well. And my, my deep concern for people across the world, I'd, I'd like to, that deep concern, the sense that everybody matters and matters profoundly to make sense in my broader picture. And, you know, again, sometimes some religious pictures will, will help to facilitate that attitude. Uh, again, I don't know that I'd give it up if I drop my religious beliefs, but so anyhow, I mean, we had a kind of a complicated enough mm-hmm. picture here. You know, anyhow, some people have a picture where they can tuck their agnostic sentiments, their their kind of sense that oftentimes we don't really know for sure or anywhere near with a certainty we'd like that our religious convictions or our metaphysical convictions are true. And again, I, I don't know how to, I can't read a, a Aurelius on this, but you, you kind of wonder, hey, yeah, there's doubts maybe, and they, they pop up from time to time. And, and even today, as of course, you know, we see many different ethical frameworks that don't have that religious backing to them. And they'll say, as you say, well, I, I want to benefit humanity. I, I care. I have some self-interest and concern of others, and I have good reasons to do that. Okay, well, we can look toward a story, we can look toward a narrative or a framework, and that can give us some meaning, that can give us some purpose, that's some reasons to live the good life. Whatever these goals happen to be, right, it's not going to be, oh, well, anything goes, and my purpose in life is going to be going on some murderous rampage or stealing from people, and that gives me fulfillment, right? That's not going to work so well in the Stoic framework or really any framework. Yeah, I mean, though I love Dostoevsky, I'm not I'm not on the verge of becoming Raskolnikov if I give up my religious beliefs. I uh, mean to be saying that Dostoevsky is as simple as saying, you know, it's not like Dostoevsky is committed to everything his own characters say. And so, you know, if there's a passage that says, if there is no God, everything is permitted, Dostoevsky may be thinking hard about that and working out through his characters and so on. But again, I, so just criticizing that idea, I'm not attributing it to Dostoevsky, like that he made this inference, but if God is, uh, if there is no God, everything is permitted. You know, again, I, I would not make that that jump. Also, I, I think human beings have natural tendencies towards, you know, we're capable of identifying with other people under normal, uh, healthy circumstances. People grow in the ability to feel sympathy and compassion. And so there, there would still be serious, you know, moral sentiments, I think, in, in, in many people and, and following out the that compassion and acting on it would be a sensible thing to do. And so, you know, a range of moral behavior and concern would make sense. And there'd be a kind of prudence to, you know, be willing to follow the rules that other people are willing to follow. And so, and, you know, to generate the social trust to keep doing that. So again, there are, there are kind of arguments for undergirding moral con- con- commitments uh, that they don't have to appeal to, to some underlying religious beliefs, whether stoical or Christian or, or otherwise. But I, 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 I'm not going to be able to make the case right now. But again, uh, there might be something really profound about the 
do you hold can you hold on to the kind of moral rigorism with the heart of stoicism i mean the, the really you know not just the wise advice for how to live more prudently but the real rigorism moral rigorism can you know if if, if i were to drop my my religious beliefs uh, how much of my christian ethic would start to, to shake and and feel like it it lost a lot of its groundings. I, again, I don't have an answer to that question, but that, that's a that's a big, difficult, and important question. Yeah, surely we can talk for hours, and people have been pondering these questions for millennia. So yeah. it's good. Hopefully, something that listeners will think about, especially on that topic of thinking about a vocation and how can they enrich the world around them. Thanks for your time. Anything else to add? And how can people contact and find more about you? Oh, well, uh, boy, an hour and whatever, five or six minutes blew by. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's yeah. actually about as good a, a compliment as you can give to an interviewer. That Boy, that was fun, and yeah, it blew right it. by. So uh, I can be contacted by my email, just my name, reganwritesm at king.edu, and I'm happy to hear from anyone. I, I don't have other, other sites that um, I don't have a blog or, or something like that. So just email would be would be fine, and and. Uh, I'd be happy to hear from anybody who has any thoughts. Good. And I'll put that information in the show notes as well, if you mm-hmm. could spell that also for listeners. Sure. It's R-E-G-A-N-R-E-I-T-S-M-A, and then at kings.edu. Very good. And you're also on academia.edu as well, correct? That's true. I, I do have I do have papers, other papers up on academia.edu too. And so that's just, that's Regan Lance writes my you know, on the academia.edu page So Good. Yep. And thanks for coming on today and contributing. It was a very good conversation. Blew by on my end as well. Good. Thanks. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com where you can connect with me on social media. Find past episodes and join my Discord chat server for interactive discussion. Support my work by becoming a donor through Patreon or PayPal to access special rewards, including the ability to have upcoming guests, answer your questions, custom-tailored podcast episodes, and personalized one-on-one discussions. Share, comment, like, subscribe, and leave reviews to help support my efforts. Email me with your thoughts, justinvacula at gmail.com. Podcast music, used with permission, is brought to you by Phil Giordano's symphonic metal group Fairyland from their album Score to a New Beginning. Thanks to generous supporters and fans of this podcast who help support, fund, and share my work. Have a great day.